The following message was a series of papers found in a glass jar inside a quarry on top of a mound of sand in Dundalk, Maryland. They are being published here in the hopes of anyone having information on the subject below. I found myself thinking about the strange lights that were hanging above our city. There was something odd and otherworldly about them. They were dancing across the sky, and the sun was slowly disappearing behind the tall skyscrapers. Naturally, I was unsure about this night, but a lot of my friends were fine with how things were. We were going to a party, and I was going to finally see Samantha when she wasn't absorbed in her studies at school or art projects. So, what do you think you're going to do at the party, Jack? My best friend and brother, Jeff, asked me. Looking ahead, I noticed that there was an absurd amount of traffic. We had no idea why, but as far as I could tell, people were coming outside to take a look at the sky above me. But Jeff and his girlfriend Jasmine didn't look like they were remotely interested in the bizarre light show of Aurora Borealis taking place above us. I... I don't know. Maybe talk to Samantha? I said weakly. Jasmine chuckled. She always had this goofy laugh that made you feel warm inside. Had it not been for her dating my brother, I surely would have tried to at least strike up a relationship with her. She was so nice to me, even though I am nowhere near the level of coolness as Jeff. She had nothing more than beautiful tanned skin and black hair with pink highlights all on the edges. But most remarkable about all of her features was her violet eyes. They were naturally colored, which I'm guessing is relatively rare. I'm no eye expert. Jeff replied. Honestly, dude, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you actually work up the nerve to talk to her. I was going to respond to that, feeling slightly offended by the fact that he was implying that I had no balls. I could definitely ask her out if I had the right situation. Before I could get my word out, he honked his horn furiously, cursing out the people who were blocking the road. God, these people are never going to get out of the way, are they? Who cares about the stupid space lights? He shouted. Maybe the fact that we've never seen Aurora Borealis this far south might be playing a role in why everyone's out. Jasmine remarked, resting her hand on Jeff's shoulder to try and calm him down. Jeff always had this short temper when it came to strangers, but he always maintained a level of control when dealing with people that he liked. Honestly, it sometimes feels like that's the opposite with people these days. They're mean to their loved ones and nice to strangers. Without much more than twenty more minutes of trying to grind through traffic, we reached the house where the party was being held. This was supposed to be some guy named Timothy's house. I never met the guy, but I heard he's exceptionally nice to people. Had really light blonde hair and blue eyes that made all the girls jealous. Also, I'm told that he has an androgynous voice, which means he likes to trick people into thinking he's a girl as a joke before they actually see his boyish appearance. Going to have to remain vigilant, lest he tried to pull that same prank on me. Stepping inside, I was met with a barrage of strobe lights, loud EDM music blasting on surround sound, and people so closely together you could start a pandemic from this point alone. This was definitely the type of party where you didn't want your parents to find you. Perfect for Jeff. Tons of anxiety for me. Hi. A girlish voice called out from behind me. Already preparing myself, I turned around and acted smug. Yeah, I'm not falling for that one, buddy. I nearly choked when I finally saw who it was. It wasn't a blonde boy, but a black and green-haired girl. She had appeared to be Asian, which makes me think she was likely Japanese. Yes, I know the difference. Expecting someone else? She questioned me with this smug grin on her face. I, I, I thought you were Timothy behind me. She brushed her hair away from her eyes giggled a little bit before saying, No, he's currently upstairs with his posse. He decided he's not going to stay around down here and sneak up on people. But I understand why you may have thought that. Jeff interrupted, talking to this girl in such a casual manner. Leslie, you have no idea where Samantha might be. 
and my brother here wants to ask her a question. I flinched and had a mini heart attack when he decided to come out with that. I, I can wait, I shouted abruptly. A few of the people closest were giving me that look. It was so embarrassing to make such a scene. Jeff smiled triumphantly before walking away to join up with his friends. Leslie paid no more attention to what he had said and told me. If you do want to talk to Samantha, I hear she's hanging out with some boys down in the basement. My heart nearly sank into my intestines when I heard that. Was there something less than child-friendly going on downstairs? Now I was panicking and thinking that she probably is already getting herself a boyfriend as we speak. And here I am, terrified to even talk to her. I told Leslie goodbye and swiftly wormed my way through the crowd and reached the basement stairs. Down there, it was as crowded as up top. Had this kid invited the whole school? I was finding it hard to even see where Samantha was located, and the worst part about all of this was the constant bumping into me by various teenagers. I have a don't-touch-me policy. The music was so loud down here that I thought I might even develop a massive headache from how obnoxious it was. Dubstep is obviously the worst music, right next to country. I can't find her anywhere, I whined, low enough to make sure no one heard me. I quickly gave up. Fighting my way back up to the first floor, I could already feel the onset of the headache. I looked for a bathroom where I could escape to, and thankfully, there was a paper taped onto a door that said, Bathroom. Throwing myself in, I quickly shut the door and breathed in a sigh of relief. When I turned around, I was shocked to see that there was someone else in here. A short girl, cute-looking, and with cute, black hair. Excuse me, Twig. I'm using this right now. Thankfully, she was looking at herself in the mirror. Her eyes looked red and watery. I suspected that she had been crying just now. Then I remembered. What? I'm not a twig. I, I weigh... I remembered I only weighed 115 pounds. I noticed where your eyes were looking the moment you saw me. I'll call you whatever I like. She harshly replied back. I... sorry. I wasn't trying to be a perv if that's what you're thinking. I wasn't expecting someone to be in here. I see. She looked unconvinced of my apology. Scratching my head, I quickly turned around, but realized that my headache was probably going to be irritated the moment I heard the music at full blast. The door was the only thing muffling the sound. I don't want to go out there. I whispered under my breath, thinking about how much this was going to hurt. You don't like the sound out there? She spoke much more calmly this time. Turning back to her, I replied, I... not really. I only came because my brother practically begged me. Oh, I was supposed to be here with my friends, but they've run off on me. I don't know where they are. I noticed you seemed a little bit upset about something. How observant. She sounded as if she was admonishing me. But, well, if you wanted me to leave, I'll do it. No, no. She changed her tone. It's fine. Just stay over there. She clearly didn't trust me, but at the same time, she could tell that I was distressed by the loud sounds outside. Any minute now, I looked as if I was on the verge of throwing up. I thought about how nauseating this was making me. It was getting warm and sweaty from all the people dancing, the loud, obnoxious music, and a sense of jealousy over my crush being surrounded by boys made me wish that I could be like everyone else and enjoy this moment like my brother. Yet here I am, in the bathroom, with a girl who is clearly thinking I'm up to no good. Waiting for the moments where my headache would die down, I slumped down to the ground, putting her more at ease. I can hear two people outside having an argument. You're such an idiot. The earth's obviously flat. God, this is so gonna be a stupid argument. Sure, buddy. You keep believing that crap. Do you not watch any videos from NASA, China, or the European aerospace documentaries? The Earth's clearly round. Now listen here. 
I tried to block them out. I had no interest in dealing with such stupid arguments over things that don't matter to begin with. Whether the earth is flat or not, which I'm entirely sure it's not flat, I'm pretty sure our current problems are more around the lines of war, famine, pandemics, and those crazy world-ending events that never cease to try to end humanity. And no matter what, we always find more trivial means of distracting ourselves and ignoring the actual problems. I heard the Earth's actually a velociraptor, the girl said, cracking a soft smile at me. I smiled back, thinking about that stupid internet thing where they turn planets into anime girls. Well, I think the Earth's a donut, I said jokingly. Wow, what kind of frosting do we have? Permafrost, I said swiftly. A brief chuckle erupted between us, and this actually felt more like a comfortable situation. I figured now would be the best time to introduce myself. I'm Jack. Comet. Raising my eyebrow, I replied. Wow, that's a pretty unique name. That's the cover name I go by. I don't give out my real one unless I absolutely have to. Oh. I was a little bit disappointed. She clearly didn't trust me still, but then again, I hardly knew her anyway, so I shouldn't feel too upset. We quickly got to talking about other things. I found out what classes she was taking, why I had never seen her before, and a little bit about who her friends are. She's a grade beneath me, which explains a lot about why I hadn't seen her before. We were now sitting side by side on the floor, ignoring the fact that it was a little grimy. We were hitting it off pretty well, with the fact that we were both introverts who only hoped that we could fit in with everyone else. It felt nice to finally have someone to relate to. So, this is just an idea, but you maybe want to go outside for a walk? Her face brightened up, and she seemed to be showing me some interest in my proposal. She looked like she was about to answer, but we were quickly interrupted when a low rumbling managed to overshadow the music. It sounded so horrendous, captivating, and monstrous. We had to cover our ears, and I could hear people panicking outside the door. What was that? I asked, not expecting comments to answer. Let's go check it out, she said. Comet and I ran outside, separating when we managed to spot our groups. She ran towards her friends, and I ran towards Jeff and Jasmine. What's going on? I asked. Neither one of them answered me, for everyone was staring up at the night sky. The Aurora Borealis had gotten much worse. Not only had it filled the entire nighttime sky, but the bands of lights were stretching down so far they were practically hovering above the towers nearby. Then all of the lights around town suddenly went out. There was screaming from a few girls, but that was quickly drowned out when a loud, low rumble broke through the air, sounding similar to a passing train. I had to cover my ears again because it was so irritating towards my headache. Then the ground began to wobble. Not so much that everything came collapsing down, but hard enough to where you had to stand still. This provided to be difficult in a crowd because everyone was clinging on to one another for support. Again, I don't like being touched. Hey! Jeff tried to call out to me and Jasmine. We need to get to the car! I thought the best thing we could do at that moment was to stand still and wait for the earthquake to stop but that all changed when the sky started to bleed. And I mean, it was literally tearing itself open, ripping like paper into a dozen pieces. From the tear points, green liquid was leaking out and dripping down onto the city. A massive droplet managed to hit a few of the other partygoers, covering them. They were knocked down, but their bodies were quickly dissolving into the green liquid, which only managed to send everyone else into a panic. More of the green liquid began to fall down from the sky, and we were quick to run back into the house. Jeff was tagging behind us, trying to push me and his girlfriend into the building. At that moment, I remembered Comet. Was she still out there, getting pelted by that green slime? But Jeff kept yelling for us to move. Once back inside, everyone was bustling about what was going on. A few girls were sitting on the steps, crying, 
and everyone else was trying to process what had happened. Quickly, people were turning on their phones and lighting up the place to try and provide any light that we could get. With so many on, you could identify any familiar face that you saw in the crowd. Jeff, what do we do? I looked to him for guidance. He seemed unable to grasp the situation himself. He kept scratching his head, shaking it, and when I thought maybe he would regain his composure, he let out a spine-chilling scream. I don't believe he was truly able to grasp what we had witnessed. I was too busy wondering where Samantha and Comet were. My brother went over to the corner to sit down on the couch. Jasmine was quick to try and comfort him in this moment of weakness. My brother, the most in-control guy, the most completely nonchalant, popular man in school, was reduced to a cowering mess. This was a frightening thing for me. I always looked up to him and to see him so distraught was making me feel like there truly wasn't anything that we could do to calm down the situation. Everyone! A feminine voice called out for attention. It was Timothy and Leslie. Please stay inside the house until the weird stuff falling from the sky stops. I was thinking about how dumb that sounded. He got our attention to tell us what we were obviously going to do anyway. Perhaps I'm being too critical in this moment, where I'm trying to grasp the situation. Of course, I was thankful that whatever that green slime was, it wasn't melting through the house. That alone seemed strange, but maybe the slime only affected certain material, like flesh. Jack? A familiar voice called out to me. I turned around and saw that it was Samantha. Uh, oh, uh, hey! I was genuinely happy to see her. At least she was safe. That might sound selfish, because it's clearly my desire to still have a relationship with her, but I genuinely did want her to make it through this, the same as everyone else. I heard that Jeff and Jasmine were coming. I'm surprised that you're here. Ouch. I replied, trying to hide my hurt ego. Yeah, well, I wasn't expecting this to be the last party I would ever go to. She clearly didn't feel uncomfortable with my remark, and I didn't want her to feel insecure. Don't worry, uh, soon the National Guard and Red Cross will be here. Uh, this whole situation will be resolved as long as we remain safe. Thankfully, she seems to believe that. On my part, I too believed that. It only made sense that eventually, someone from the outside would notice that a large city such as Warmire, Colorado, was suddenly struck by a freak event involving the Aurora Borealis. I was wondering why there weren't any sirens going off. You would think something like this would have tried to warn everyone ahead of time. I and Samantha huddled next to my brother and Jasmine, remaining in our corner until Leslie approached us. She was clearly close friends with Jeff, not surprisingly, and the look on her face was pretty grim. Guys, we should all go somewhere private. I want to warn you because I think you might be able to handle it best since you're the only ones holding it together. She clearly wasn't paying attention to my brother. Upstairs, Timothy was sitting on his parents' bed, and he was raising an eyebrow when he noticed me. What's he and the girl doing here? Leslie explained on our behalf that we were close associates with Jeff. Jeff was still shaking, but looking much better now. I'm alright now, he reaffirmed. Alright, what I'm about to let you guys in on, you don't tell anyone else. We looked around at each other and moved in closer. He pulled out his phone and pressed a few buttons before a message played. Timothy. A woman's voice broke through. Stay home and lock the door. There's soldiers, fully armored, like tanks, and they're not letting us go back in. Your dad forgot something, and we were coming back. Just stay home. There's something strange going on in the sky, so go to the basement if you can. For a moment, there was a hesitation in her voice as if she was trying to contemplate what was going on. We looked at each other, and back at Timothy. Oh god, what the- Static. Drive away, we need to- Static. Her screams were followed by an unearthly screeching sound that sounded like a foul beast from another planet. It was so heart-wrenching, because, after all, the sound of crashing metal followed after- the message stopped, 
and there was a long silence that filled the room. Timothy looked down at the floor, clearly hurting because that meant his parents were dead. Or, at the least, in a nasty car wreck. Jeff spoke. Timothy, I don't know what to say. I'll worry about what may or may not have happened later. Right now we need to deal with the current situation. It seemed like until someone with more experience came along, Timothy, Leslie, and Jeff were going to be in charge. Samantha and I were going to have to fill the roles of support. Back downstairs, we saw that the door was wide open, and people were looking out at the green slime that was still dripping down onto the pavement. Leslie quickly started admonishing them for their stupidity. They had already forgotten about the fact that whatever this slime was... It kills people. One of the tall guys, clearly a football player, pointed at the spots where those people who got hit by the slime earlier were. When we all took a look, I nearly threw up at the sight of what was now in their place. It was so unnerving to see. Gone were the human bodies, replaced by a mass of skin and organs that were all mixed around each other into a biomass pancake on the ground. I could see the few eyes that were protruding out of the fleshy pancake, blinking, alerting me that there was still a little life left in whatever that was. Whoever that was. Oh, that's sick, Leslie shouted. She quickly closed the door, not wanting anyone else to get hit with this stuff. Now things were truly spiraling out of control for the rest of us. I wasn't believing in my earlier statement about the National Guard or Red Cross showing up. Now it was starting to look more like the apocalypse for the rest of us. The only question that remained was whether this was situated in our local area, or was this range much further than we anticipated. Then, I started to worry about my parents, wondering if they were safely indoors when all this went down. I needed to know these things. I couldn't bear the thought of losing them. I wouldn't want them to become one of those things on the ground. A few hours passed, and not much else was happening. The green slime was getting worse outside, breaking up from the giant droplets that it was originally, turning more into a downpour of tinier droplets. Everyone was told to keep indoors, and we noticed that the plant life outside was also starting to warp. The leaves were meshing in with one another. The tree branches, in turn, started to twist themselves in, almost as if everything around us was melting. But this wasn't happening to any of the buildings. A pole with wires running through it was nearby and made of wood, but it looked completely fine. I wondered if maybe it was because it wasn't dead. Perhaps dead things couldn't melt together. A theory that I have. I wonder if my parents are okay. Samantha chimed in. I brushed this off with a wave of my hand to keep things positive. As long as they're inside, they should be fine. But don't you remember that sound on the phone? She reminded me. I didn't want to think about it. I assumed it was maybe the sound we heard earlier when I was in the bathroom with Comet. They did sound similar to one another. I guess I just blotted it out of my mind. She scratched her whipped-up, dirty blonde hair and cleaned off her glasses. Her body movements were becoming more fidgety, and she looked as if she was on the verge of a panic attack. I wonder, whatever this was, it didn't sound like a normal animal cry. It was way too aggressive, and it kind of makes me feel a sense of dread, you know? I'll be honest, the sound didn't affect me the same way. I always had a love for horror movies particularly cosmic for being my favorites. Strange monster sounds weren't something I wasn't used to hearing. But upon further thoughts, I realized that it's much worse when you're hearing those sounds in real life. Yeah, yeah, I know I'm a bit more concerned about that. She nervously laughed, and I was also kind of laughing back with unease building up in my chest, like a bird trying to peck away out of my ribcage. The mood had definitely calmed down somewhat. In fact, a few of the other partygoers had already fallen asleep. Clearly, the alcohol had gotten to them, but it felt nice. 
knowing that I could share this slightly tender moment despite all of the horrible things happening outside. But I had to remain focused on trying to get through this night. The sky isn't exactly a night sky anymore. There's nothing more than green-tinted darkness that envelops the entire outside, making everyone feel on edge. And something told me that tomorrow wasn't going to be any better. But for now, I'm going to relish this moment where the girl that I had a crush on for years was more interested in staying near me than her own friends or any of the other boys here. Well, things are already spiraling out of control. I'd fallen asleep, but was stirred when I heard screaming coming from upstairs. It was in Timothy's sister's bedroom. His sister was not with us. She was traveling with his parents, but Timothy was kind enough to let the girls sleep in there. Apparently, a creep who was at the party was trying to sneak in and got caught sniffing one of the girls' hair while they were asleep. When I and a few of the others reached the room, the girls had pushed the guy to the ground for his intrusion. He was about what you would expect. Fat neck rolls, fuzzy beard, and smelling like he hadn't showered in days. How he had gotten to the party is something only I can guess. Get away from us! One of the girls screamed at him, throwing one of the lamps at his face. No, no, I just wanted to... He was struck by said lamp. Hey! Jeff hollered from behind me even getting me startled. Everyone quieted down, respecting the overall authority of my brother. He walked in, took one look at the disgusting guy on the ground and the freaked-out woman on the other side of the room. It was pretty clear what he was up to. Jeff ordered two of the football players, uh, two of which were dating the girls, to take the guy downstairs, where we tied him to a chair. Listen, I thought I heard something in their room, so I wanted to investigate... It's not what you think. He tried to cover his tracks. One of the girls, a blonde with way too much makeup on, approached and stated her side of the story. Is that why I caught you sniffing Jessica's hair? I, I wasn't sniffing it. I thought I heard something coming from her blankets. That's all. There wasn't... He momentarily lost his train of thought, wondering if this was even going to make sense. We could tell lies in the heat of the moment weren't his strongest suit. Do you really expect us to believe that? Why didn't you get one of the others to go with you to check it out? Timothy questioned him further. I, uh... I already knew what he was thinking. Even if his story is true, which I don't believe it is, this only paints him in this sort of light. I explained. Let me guess. If you were hoping that if there was something in there, these girls would fall all over you and want to date you for saving them. He snarled at me, which I had to hold in a laugh because I've never been snarled at. This dude clearly had breathing issues. Besides that, we all knew what he was truly up to. His story didn't hold up well either, but now began the discussion of what to do with him. One of the boyfriends of the girls demanded, Let's kick him out in the rain. Something like that was a little unnerving to hear. This guy was basically suggesting that we kick a guy out to his death. I had no sympathy for creeps, but I wouldn't want them to become a gelatinous biomass on the ground. This would make me a murderer. Unfortunately, other people in the crowd looked like they were agreeing. Samantha stepped forward and tried to plead. Wait, we can't do that. We don't have the authority to take the death penalty into our own hands. When help arrives and it comes out about what we did, we'll be in big trouble. Her rational thought did manage to garner some support for her side. Then, of course, some didn't look like they cared at all. A group indifferent to this confrontation is just what we needed to keep things under control. Leslie spoke up. We're not going to kill him. We're going to lock him up in the coat closet until help arrives. One side of the camp, the kill him side, murmured amongst themselves. They looked like they wanted to fight back but there were a few strong guys that were more willing to support Timothy and Leslie. Not to mention, my charismatic brother was also on Timothy's side. That establishment of power had given us the advantage. For now, things were a little heated, but stable. Back in Timothy's parents' room, he sat on his parents' bed, 
rubbing his forehead, clearly becoming anxious about the rising tension. I think people are going to listen to our order, Leslie said. Jeff added, for now. I spoke up, feeling a bit more enthusiastic about my newfound level of authority thanks to my connections with those with the popularity of the group. I wouldn't be surprised if they broke up into a rivaling group. It's tribalism now, and tribes rarely ever have any stability. That's any form of society, Jack, Samantha said. I don't think that our group is sustainable now that someone has to go and rub everyone the wrong way. She was right. Plus, them being teenagers isn't going to help. As if kids are good at running a society like ours at the moment. How I wish there was an adult here to be the leader. Leslie asked for my brother. Hey, Jeff. Yeah? You still got your car out there, don't you? Well, yeah, but... I'm pretty sure he knew as well as I what she was about to suggest. I chimed in. Are you suggesting that we abandon everyone? These people who want blood, they're going to grow. We don't have the manpower to sustain control over the house. I mean, who wants to listen? And I don't mean any offense to you, Timothy, but who wants to listen to a boy with a girlish voice? He gave her the are you serious look, obviously irritated by her remark. Hey, so what if my voice doesn't sound masculine? I still wear boys clothes. She rolled her eyes with a smirk on her face that she tried to hide from him, but I could see from my angle. Jeff interrupted. Anyway, let's try to figure out a way out of this in case things get worse. I don't think our food supply is going to last much longer. I was more concerned about how we were still getting water. It still was coming out of the faucets, but according to Timothy, that is because he has a water tank on the top of his house. There was a power outage a few years back, and his parents didn't want to deal with that mess again. So they got a generator and water tank. We just couldn't get to the generator because it was outside, which turned out to be a bad idea. I went back down, waiting to see how everyone was doing. It was still dark, but with flashlights now, it was much easier to move around. Samantha was tending to the girls in the bedroom, Jeff was maintaining a watchful eye on anyone who might be trying to get to the closet, while that creep was still screaming about how the girls deserved it, and we're all going to die anyway, might as well enjoy ourselves. He didn't take long to show his true colors. Timothy and Leslie also were upstairs, trying to figure out their next move. Jasmine was nowhere to be found, but I wondered if the basement was in any better shape. Despite the house not being too big, it seemed as if certain people were going to their retrospective areas, almost like civilization itself in a two-story building. In the basement, there was a variety of different people. Most notably, there were the punks, cybergoths, and generally, the people who don't socialize well with the most mainstream groups of people. And that is where I spotted Comet. Hey! I shouted abruptly, instantly getting embarrassed. She looked at me and smiled warily. She walked towards me, the same as I. Once we were finally able to reach each other near the center of the room, we could talk. I guess you made it inside, I said. Yeah. Yeah, we did. My friends ran back in the moment the sky started to tear open. Then we heard about the green slime that's been raining down. Well, I'm glad you're safe. Why in the basement? I looked around. She shrugged her shoulders. I don't care, I guess. I guess it feels safer to be further away from that rain. We also heard about what's been going on upstairs. Yeah, we're a little on edge. It's not safe considering how someone had to go and mess up the stability of the group already. We walked over to the side of the room, leaning against the brick wall. I was having a bit of a moment where I was feeling terrified. With all the commotion going on and the threats of death overhead, I had to put on this brave face, act like I was someone in control of my emotions, and surprisingly, even with my brother, who had his meltdown a few hours back, he quickly regained his composure. But I don't think he truly has it. If anything, we're all wearing masks of calmness, faced with apocalyptic doomsday right outside our windows. So, do you think help's coming? She asked. Of course. Don't say that, she admonished me. 
I want to hear you say it with sincerity. I'm not like some people who need to hear what they want to hear. I want to hear what needs to be said. I looked at her. She was dead serious. And even though I had tried my best to convince myself that this was all going to blow over, long story short, there wasn't anyone coming to rescue us. Whatever this is, they were trying to contain it. That's why Timothy's parents couldn't come back. That is why there haven't been any attempts to try and get survivors. We're all on our own. No, I said, in defeat. She gave me a soft nod, and I could feel it in the air. The sense of dread overwhelmed both of us, knowing full well that this was probably going to be our grave. Everyone here was going to die, either becoming biomass or from killing one another out of human division on whether or not we should kick someone out for trying to commit a gross trespass, or we're going to die from starvation and thirst. Most likely thirst. I don't think that the water tank has much longer with more than 30 people in one building. I want to let you know we're going to try to escape if things get so bad that we have to. I told her. She looked at me, raising her eyebrow. How? That rain will probably kill you on your way out. Before I could get out another word, a commotion erupted upstairs. This caught our attention, and we quickly ran up to the first floor. They had opened the door again and looked out. Leslie was there, but she wasn't so keen on getting it closed this time. That's when I noticed there were no more droplets hitting the roof and walls outside anymore. The rain had stopped. Look at that, a tall, muscular guy said, standing closest out on the porch. It's a good thing he was wearing shoes. When I looked out the window, everything looked different. There were patches of black slime covering all over the ground. It was more obvious where the grass had been, creating green biomass. The trees had almost completely melted into their own pancake-shaped forms, made of wood and leaves. The sky was now cleared up, and we could clearly see where we were. Up in the sky, a large, swirling tunnel was passing us by. It was clearly moving. We were going up, as it looked from our perspective. The walls of the vortex were black, swirly, and at the center was a white light that seemed to barely manage to break through the green mist in the air. It was still dark, but thankfully bright enough for us to see. Well, Comet piped up. Looks like escaping should be a little easier now. I looked at her unsure about this change of events. What were we going to do next? I guess we could leave, but where to? Hesitation hung heavily in the air. A lot of us wanted to take a step out, but we weren't sure what would happen the moment we were fully exposed. What if the green slime returned while we were out in the open? But there was also the problem of people wanting to get rid of our disgraced guest, as far as we were aware, your clothing did not provide you with protection if you were to touch any of the wet surfaces. The green slime apparently was absorbed into the ground, which would explain why there were no puddles. Still, that didn't bring anyone comfort. Quickly, Comet and I separated for a little bit, promising each other to meet up later in the living room. I needed to speak with Timothy and Jeff about what to do next. We had gathered back in the bedroom... Timothy was sitting at his father's desk in front of the window, overlooking the streets below, which was filled up with people who had been hiding indoors the entire time. So, I guess our escape plan's a bust, Jeff remarked. Well, this is much better than trying to sneak out and leave a bunch of people to massacre each other. Jasmine gave him a sassy remark back. Look, I'm not in the least bit concerned what a bunch of strangers do to one another. My only concerns are for me, you, my brother, and our immediate group here. Well, that sounds like you're not a compassionate person. He clicked his tongue, rolling his eyes away from her. Jasmine was more concerned for the welfare of the group, but my brother was more concerned for the welfare of people he knew. In my mind, both have their rights and wrongs. Personally, and this might be based on a biased learning, but I prefer my brother's stance. 
It's much more important to care for those who are in your life than to value everyone the same. It doesn't matter. Timothy spoke. We can leave now, and the first thing we should be doing is going out to get a stash of food and weapons. We're gonna need them. Everyone in the room was in agreement with that idea. When we came back downstairs, there were already people putting plastic underneath their clothes. A smart move. That way the green slime can't touch our skin. One of the smarter kids at the party suggested that the black slime that we were seeing patched all over the ground and walls outside was microorganisms and insects that were merging into one another. Our means of action was to get into Jeff's car and start driving around for more supplies. Obviously, everyone was going to leave Timothy's house, probably go to their house to see if their loved ones were still alive. That became the plan for us as well, but not for Timothy. He never mentioned once about going out to see if his parents were still out there. Everyone else was getting geared up, wrapping plastic around their feet, putting on heavy clothing all around their bodies, rubber and plastic gloves, and whatever else we could use to cover up our faces well enough. It was incredibly uncomfortable, but better to be safe than sorry. That's when I noticed that Timothy was hanging down one of the hallways in the dark, far away from the rest of us. When I moved closer... I could hear him sniffling. Heavy breathing was overwhelming the air around me, knowing full well that he was in the middle of crying. I wasn't too sure what to do in the situation, but something pushed me along to call out to him. Timothy? He quickly tried to clean up his face with his arms. What? What do you want? You don't look like you're doing so well. I don't need any help. Everyone needs help sometimes. I'm good. I'm just perfect. His voice cracked. I understood fully what was going on. All of the pressure of having to keep the peace, the fact that his parents are probably not around anymore because of the recording, and with everyone planning on going their separate ways, I'm certain he's worried that he's going to be all by himself. I moved closer and placed my hand on his shoulder to try and console him. I think I know what you're thinking. You don't know that. The sobering, partial cracking of his voice made me realize he was on the verge of a breakdown. You've been trying to hold everything together up until this point. You've always been looking tough in front of everybody, but this is how you really feel, right? Uh, no. I, I mean, I... He couldn't continue putting up his facade. His body was shaking, and he clenched his fists tightly before turning around and resting his head into my chest. Tears moistened my shirt. He sobbed more loudly. I told you I was fine. He cried. He was hurting. I can't worry about how this may look in front of others when he's in need of someone to reassure him that he's not alone. I gave him a pat on the back, which kind of felt nice and awkward at the same time. It made me feel like I was actually able to do something for someone else for once, at least. Plus, he was shorter than me, so it made me feel a little more like the big man. Maybe this is how Jeff feels all the time when he has to be my rock during times of distress. Like when I almost thought I wasn't going to pass my grade last year. You clearly aren't, I told him. Sobbing harder into my chest, he replied. It's not fair. I don't understand why this had to happen. I'm going to be all by myself after this. I tried to think of what else I could say. We'll be here for you. I promise. I'm so tired. I was actually scared of something breaking out and having to deal with violence. I just wanted to throw a cool party for the people I liked. I didn't want to have to keep everything in. Now my parents are dead. I reminded him that he has friends here who are willing to take care of him. If he needs to, he can come stay with me and Jeff at our place. He's already taken care of us. We need to take care of him. Plus, he's been a good leader. He doesn't give himself enough credit. He was lucky that this didn't last too long. Otherwise, things would have gotten way worse had this rain prolonged any longer. Let's go check out the city, I said giving him a warm smile to at least provide him some comfort. A few more. 
I want a few more minutes, he replied, pressing his head harder. I tried not to let him hear me exhale. Uh, am I interrupting something? I pulled back and quickly turned around to see that Comet was standing behind me. Oh, uh, hey, I shouted abruptly. Having a bro moment? I, uh, yeah. Timothy spoke up, wiping his eyes. He was uh, giving me some reassurance. I was in a panic, but both of them laughed together as if they were good friends. Why am I not surprised? Comets also gave me a peace sign and walked away to the living room. Timothy nudged my shoulder and said, There, I got you all warmed up for her. Was he implying that I wanted to ask her out? I mean, she's cute, but I kind of had my sights on Samantha. But maybe I should keep my eye open on someone else. It couldn't hurt. Stepping outside was the first obstacle. Our group, consisting of me, my brother, his girlfriend, Jasmine, Timothy, Leslie, Samantha, Comet, and two of her friends, along with six other people who were coming with us. This was way too much to fit in the car already, but that didn't matter, because the car was covered in slime and none of us were brave enough to touch it. We didn't trust the gloves since we wanted to limit as much contact with the slime as much as possible. We had to walk like everyone else. Stepping through the slick green and black liquid that covered the surface of everything, I was glad that none of us were starting to melt. We had to put on layers, and I was already starting to cook underneath these winter clothes. Timothy was wearing merely a sweater and thick black pants. He was wearing the lightest out of everyone. The girls were wearing his clothes, and Jeff and I had larger winter clothes from his parents. At this point, I didn't care that I was wearing women's snow pants, but I did hope that I wasn't going to be made fun of by the girls. It just so happened that I could fit in his mom's pants. What's that? Leslie pointed up ahead of us. What in God's holy world? Timothy muttered, still approaching the strange object, while the rest of us froze in place. In front of us were two masses of dark green and dark yellow sludge that was taking an indescribable shape in the middle of the street. They were growing upwards, forming two stems and bulging outwards from the base. They look like feet forming, Jasmine said. She was right. Now that she had put it into perspective, I could see that toes were starting to split off from one another. All of the black sludge on the ground was moving towards it, carried by the thin green slime that was still pulling them towards the feet. If these are supposed to be the feet, where do you think the rest of whatever this thing is is going to be? One of Comet's friends, a blonde woman with a blue dragon tattoo on her right arm, remarked. Timothy looked curious about the amalgamation forming in front of us. This looks gnarly if you ask me. I reminded everyone. I uh, look, guys, we should keep going. I don't think we want to find out what those feet are trying to turn into. Everyone quickly got back on board, and we continued to move, traveling about four blocks down the road, only to quickly hear thumping sounds further ahead of us. Jeff spoke nervously. Was that a giant footstep? It sounded like it was coming our direction, and not from the two giant feet way in the back. That's when I came to the realization that there were more of these creatures already, and they clearly had formed. Let's just... I was stopped when another loud thumping vibrated through the ground. We looked up, and an 18-story building shook violently before collapsing in. We ran as fast as we could to the side of the road, heading towards an old Chinese noodle shop. I quickly grabbed one of the door handles and let everyone else in until I was the last one, giving me a glimpse of what was coming through the huge plume of smoke and dust. With one look, I saw that it had a massive brain-shaped head, six eyes, three on each side, and a very skinny neck extended. Everyone was yelling for me to come inside, as the smoke and ashes overwhelmed my vision, forcing me to close the door. 
We ran to the back of the room, getting behind the counter and watching as heavy footsteps shook the ground like an earthquake. Jeff was cradling Jasmine in his arms, and what took me by surprise was that Comet, not Samantha, was clinging on to me. Her eyes were watering with tears, and she looked more frightened than Samantha. I needed to be a man at that moment and be there for those who needed me. I wrapped my arms around her, pulling her close to me so that she would remain calm and know that if anything happened, I would bear the brunt of it. I looked over from the side of the counter space, looking into the darkness, but I could still see that dark green light through the smoke outside. Two long, black shapes moved slowly past us. Whatever the creature was, it did not notice us or make an attempt to come after us. So, for now, we were safe. Once we had gotten our bearings, we quickly left the Chinese shop, and since that moment with Comet, she won't quit talking to her friend in secret and keeping her distance from me a lot more. I'm not an idiot or some dense guy. I'm well aware that they are talking about me. Whether it's good or bad, that I'm not sure about. I hope that it's not for anything bad. But ever since that moment of keeping her safe and using my own body as a shield should anything have happened, I can't help but keep thinking about her every time I remember that moment with the monster outside. I really hope this isn't turning into what I think it might be. Regardless, Leslie suggested that we find a place to stay until we can get to me and Jeff's house. We live further out of the way, but we have a nice home with plenty of food, assuming no one's already raided it. We found an apartment building, went inside, and began knocking on the doors. There were still some people inside, but they wouldn't let us in. Understandable, that green slime was on our clothes somewhat, but we needed a place that was empty. Unfortunately, all of the empty ones were locked, and we weren't sure how trying to bust in was going to be viewed by the other tenants. Thankfully, it wasn't long before there was an open one near the top floor, giving us a good view of the surrounding area. I went up to the windows, staring out at the city around us. Depression was quickly setting in, seeing how hopeless her situation was. I couldn't see that monster anywhere. A double-edged sword, if you think about it. For one, that means that it's not anywhere near us. But on the other hand, it could be behind the building for all we know. See anything? Timothy asked, stretching his arms behind his head. No, I'd say it's okay for now, but that dark barrier sure is creepy. Yeah, I can't see what it looks like from here, but it's like a swirling smokescreen that has blocked off the entire city from the outside world. Clicking my tongue, they turned back towards the couch and prepared to get some shut-eye. Everyone had either chosen the beds or couches, but one of us had to keep watch. Timothy volunteered for the first part of the night. I was to get up next but there was a huge problem the moment I fell asleep. I opened my eyes, looked around, and found myself lying on a mountain of arms. They were charcoal black, cold to the touch, and withered. They kept swaying like grass until they were alerted to my presence. They reached out and began grabbing hold of me, pulling on my legs and torso. One managed to grip the top jaw of my mouth, and they all began to pull, I kept screaming, thrashing around frantically, hoping to get them off. But it was in vain. I began to feel my bones being pulled until... I woke up screaming, with a fire in my throat, alongside everyone else who was asleep. Timothy was trying to wake us up and console those who were crying. Jeff was crying. What was that? Leslie said hyperventilating and holding onto her stomach. Timothy looked perplexed and said, I, I don't know. I was looking outside and all of you started screaming in your sleep. It was like you were all having a nightmare at the same time. Comet came out from nowhere, covered in sweats and hyperventilating as hard as everyone else was. Why, why does it seem like we all had nightmares? Jeff said. Why didn't this happen the first night? Tim, how long were we asleep? About four hours, I think. 
Jasmine recollected, saying, We only slept two at the house, thanks to that pervert waking everyone. I wondered about that guy. Did we ever let him out? The screaming started to erupt from all throughout the hallways outside. While the rest of us were recuperating, Timothy went to the door and opened it. The sounds of people in the other rooms were deafening. They were screaming, wailing, bursting out into these blood-curdling, tormented terrors that were enough to give me flashbacks of the arms again. This was a nightmare in real life. The arms were creeping in all around me even while I was awake. I felt them slowly moving around my back and over my shoulders and under my arms, their cold grip still lingering. I tried to ignore it and saw Samantha pacing back and forth. She looked as if she was in a trance. She kept staring around, bug-eyed. It was starting to worry me, but I was more afraid of the other girl, one of Comet's friends. She was a goth girl, but I never got her name. She remained quiet throughout most of our trip, only responding if you ask her anything. She looked as if she were contemplating something, thinking hard about what she was going to do next. What did everyone dream about? Timothy questioned us. Jeff swallowed hard. Well, I just... I was in a tunnel. It was dark, like an old subway system. I was walking on the tracks when I thought I heard something creepy up behind me. I turned around, and a wall of people with gray skin was rolling towards me. I tried to run away, but they grabbed hold of me and started pulling me in. I remember all the kicking and screaming. Such a hoarse screeching came from those things. We looked at him, each one of us wondering, but I could tell from the look of everyone that they had slightly different experiences. For me, they were blackened hands. I told them the gist of my story. Comet mentioned how instead it was a giant gray head that swallowed her. Leslie said that black bones were shooting out from the ground until one of them managed to go through her abdomen. Everyone else mentioned similar stuff. Humanoids made of gray and black skin, sometimes the appendages, sometimes being the whole body. I think none of us are going to get any sleep. I think none of us are going to get any sleep. Timothy made the time to give an ill-conceived joke. Really funny, but I guess that means we're going to have to go back out so we can get to my house. Jeff reminded me. Out? Uh, out again? The goth girl asked. Well, duh. Leslie glared at her. How else are we going to get back to Jeff and Jack's house? I can't. She stepped back to the other end of the room, pressing herself against the wall. Calm down, Denise. Take deep breaths. Comet held out her hand, trying to rationalize with her friends. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. Everyone stood back, freaked out by how messed up she was starting to look. I stared at her, and our eyes met for merely a moment before she charged full sprint ahead, bashing her head against the glass window, causing it to rupture. She bounced back, but went for a second sprint. Jeff went in to try and grab her, but she merely lashed her arm at him and went down with a single hit. She didn't look strong, but she hit him with a harsh strike that was animalistic, which made me wonder. I merely kept my distance, but I calculated that if I went for the legs... I might have a chance to stop her. Denise, stop! The other girl and Comet were pleading. Everyone was too afraid to get near her now. She took one step back and punched the glass outwards, creating her exit. Then, she closed her eyes and swan-dived out the window, leaving the whole room filled with the terrified screams from Comet and her friend leaving shocked and baffled looks on Timothy, Leslie, myself, and Jeff. Samantha froze as if she was going to faint from the sight of this dark moment. What was that all for? Jeff screamed angrily. Not a word could escape anyone's mouth. We all pondered why a bout of insanity had taken one of us. A question without an answer. After a little time had passed, we knew that we needed to keep moving. 
We also knew sleeping was not going to be an option anymore. Whatever it was that she dreamt of, it messed her up. Denise was gone. Like, literally. Finally went downstairs, mentally preparing ourselves for the horrible sights. All we found of her was a red batch of sludge that had spread out all over the pavement. The green slime was quick to make work of her. Her flesh and organs were already becoming a flesh blob. Anyone want to say something before we leave? I said. Comet was the first one to move closer to where her friend died. I... I wish I could have done something for you. But what you did was so sudden. I don't know what we could have done. But at least now you're not suffering anymore. The other girl also approached and appeared as if she was praying. She didn't say anything out loud, but murmured it within her prayer. I guess it made sense that not a lot of us did much other than a moment of silence. We didn't know the girl personally, and we knew that it would take too long and we were extremely vulnerable as long as we were outside. Well, I regrettably had to say, we should get moving. Timothy nodded and took charge by standing at the front. Jeff took to his right, Leslie to his left, and I in the back. Samantha, Comet, Jasmine, and the other girl, Tara, stayed in the center. This was a good little setup that we had, and I kept most of the girls safe by staying in the center. Except for Leslie, because Leslie is a tomboy. I think we only have to go a few more blocks over until we reach our house, Jeff reminded everyone. Hopefully it wasn't ransacked and our parents were safe. Not too long after saying that, we felt a huge vibration rumble through the ground. Was it that monster that we saw earlier? I just so happened to look down at the right time and saw that the green and black slime was moving. It was sliding behind me, prompting me to turn around and take a look. My body froze instantly. What? Jeez. Hey, Timothy asked. What's going on? He froze up like me, and everyone turned around to repeat exactly what was happening to us. There's no way our luck is that bad, Jasmine said. There's no way our luck is that bad. What we were witnessing was that the green and black slime were mixing swirling in on each other and getting taller at a rapid pace. It was becoming a shapeless mass of slimy tentacles, yellow eyeballs that appeared and then disappeared as soon as they had come. Eighteen giant, ravenous mouths protruded from its surface, with jagged teeth that were malformed. On top of that, it was shrouded in an eerie green glow. An eye stalk stretched outwards and stared me down. I froze, unable to even think of what I was going to do. The eye glared at me, and eight of its tentacles stretched to grab us. We jumped towards the ground, but I became nervous, seeing that my entire front half was now covered in green slime. If any of it touches my skin, I'll start to melt. Run! Timothy screamed. The creature managed to glide across the road, forcing us to push ourselves. The stickiness of the road made it hard to move, but when you have adrenaline coursing through your body, you do your best to ignore the grip. Running as hard as we could, trying desperately to get to our house or to a building with a top that we could hide in, we found ourselves cut off by a series of cars and armored transport trucks with a symbol that didn't appear to be of police origins. The symbols had a shield with six wings coming out from the side and an eye in the center of the shield, but they were all crushed and mangled, blocking the road. Now we were truly trapped, with only a liquor store on our right and a small grocery store to our left. Timothy and the others split off in both directions, trying to break in and see if there was a way to get to the top floors. Jeff and I took it upon ourselves to distract the abomination. 
Jeff saw some shards of metal, grabbed one, and started swinging it back and forth, trying to cut off one of the tentacles. Back. I said back. Stay away from us, you disgusting mother- The creature slid one tentacle underneath and wrapped itself around his leg, throwing him out from under himself, dragging him towards one of its mouths. I jumped forward and grabbed hold of my brother's arms. Please, don't let go. He pleaded. I won't. I'll go with you if I have to. I told him. Call this a little selfish, but I had no intentions of actually getting eaten today. If I couldn't save my brother, I'd have to let go at the last second. I know that sounds wrong, but I was afraid. Afraid of whatever horrible feeling awaited both of us if we went. I didn't want to experience that, and I couldn't make such a pointless sacrifice at the expense of the rest of our group. What surprised both of us was that Timothy walked up to the monster. It was too distracted by us, and he lit a full bottle on fire with a rag and threw it right into the mouth of the creature. Its mouth exploded into flames, and it started to shrivel back from the inferno that was engulfing its mouth, releasing Jeff. Glad there were matches and Molotov bottles in that liquor store. Getting back on our feet, Jeff and I broke down into a peal of nervous laughter. This all came to an end when Jeff fell to the ground again. Jeff! I and Timothy shouted in unison. I rushed to my brother's aid and noticed that there was a tearing at his legs. The green slime was covering his exposed skin, slowly melting through the layers of flesh down to the bone. No, 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 I shouted. Everyone quickly came over. Jasmine became as stunned as I was. None of us knew what to do. We weren't sure what we could do. Jeff clung to my sleeves and was shaking violently. Get them to the house, he grunted. I... I can't leave you. You have to. That creature's still nearby, and I'm only going to slow you down. We'll carry you. I'll do it myself if I have to. I'll only be the cause of everyone's death. Go, and I'm not going to debate with you on this. Every part of my body was shaking. I was experiencing the death of my brother. Even if he could still live past this, that thing was close by. We could hear it calling out. It was reminding us of its presence. I was having such a hard time breathing as I looked at my brother losing his leg as it melted into the ground. Timothy rested his hand on my shoulder and knelt down to comfort me. We'll take care of Jasmine. He smiled. A small one, but it was there. Jasmine also knelt on the other side giving him a kiss before saying the words. I'm not leaving. You have to. No. Everyone I know is probably going to die. I at least want to be with the person I love most before that creature comes and takes both of us. I felt like reasoning, telling her that she should come with us, but I was smart enough not to try. Jeff, not so much. I can't let you do that. She smiled at him through tears. What are you going to do? Get up and stop me? The rest of us started to take our steps back. I felt so heavy in my heart as I took each step away from him. He looked like he wanted to plead with us to force her to go, but not a single one in the group could bring themselves to do it. I simply closed my eyes and said, I love you. Jeff had a look of understanding. He kept clinging on to Jasmine, and they cried into each other's arms, waiting for that monster to return. I couldn't help but occasionally keep staring back to make sure that they were there. Slowly but surely, each time I looked back, the fog that had descended all over the city slowly faded them out of view. And like that... I didn't see them anymore. Not a sound from them was ever heard. No more than ten minutes have passed, and I can't seem to find the willpower to continue. I kept thinking about maybe my brother needing me, as that creature is likely already back and attacking them yet again. I don't know if he's suffering, 
but replaying those events of seeing him and Jasmine slowly disappearing from my view has left me with little incentive to even go home at this point. Sure, I have to keep Samantha safe, plus the other two girls, and Timothy and Leslie also want to stay with me at my house, but it feels so much more empty without him around to keep us going. Timothy spoke up. We're getting close, right? I replied. Yeah, a little further. Comet glanced at me for a moment, realizing that I was not going to be able to provide her with any sort of comfort in getting to my house. Samantha looked as if she wanted to say something to me, but refrained. Finally, we took a turn onto the road leading up to my house. I wasn't feeling too hopeful, but at least I could see my parents. Hopefully see my parents. Samantha glared up ahead. Hey, uh, which one's your house again? Looking away from the ground, my eyes immediately penetrated through the thin layer of fog that surrounded us. Much to my dismay, we had spotted my house. Well, what was left of my house? No. My voice sank into a spiraling void of despair. All hope had completely left my body as I realized even my own home was gone. It was as if a bomb had exploded just above it, cratering where my house was, leaving the surrounding houses just the same. My whole neighborhood was filled with what appeared to be a bombing zone, and large footprints too. What happened here? Leslie looked around, bewildered. It looks as if there was a huge firefight going on. Is the army here? Comet asked. There were more of those black armored trucks and a downed Black Hawk nearby. Same shield symbol on them. I dropped to my knees, losing all remaining hope of seeing my family again. Now I knew nowhere else to flee. Timothy and Samantha rested their hands on my shoulders. Comet and the other girl hugged, realizing that it was going to be a long day ahead of us. Nowhere else to hide. A few of us suggested each other's homes, but everyone seems to be living closer in the city, where all the really weird stuff is happening. We thought the residential area that I lived in would be safer. That was the idea, anyway. Plus... It doesn't seem like any of the others are close to their parents, which might explain why they thought my house would be safest. My brother sacrificed himself for this, for us to reach a dead end. There was nowhere to go next. All the other houses are wrecked. Leslie suggested, Maybe a police station, an embassy. There's got to be some sort of place with people hiding out in it. I highly doubt everyone just melts it. In all honesty, we hadn't seen a lot of people over the past nine hours that we'd been walking around from Timothy's house to mine. A lot of people were probably outside looking at the Aurora Borealis when the green rain came splashing down on them. Poor suckers didn't see it coming. Well, there's always that barrier, Timothy said. Turning towards the east, he pointed at the huge black barrier not too far off in the distance that we were surrounded by. I wonder if it's a wall of a tunnel, or perhaps a cylinder-shaped dome that we're trapped in. I said, You want to go see the barrier that's surrounding us? You want to stay here till the green slime manages to get inside your clothes? Contorting my face, a little upset over his remark, but knowing that he's right, I figured that if I couldn't save any of my family, at least I could save the rest of my newfound friends. I had to work towards something, after all. It would be stupid to give up and roll over to die. And who knows, we might actually be able to get out if we look around at the barrier. Maybe find a crack or exit of some sort. Thankfully, we managed to find a pickup truck nearby at one of my neighbors, an old red ram. Perfect for us to travel further. But first, it required a wipe down of the outside so that none of the green slime that covered it got inside. 
Thankfully, there are plenty of towels in many of the other houses around the area, even though they had suffered incredible damage. I didn't know how to drive, per se, but I knew at least some of the basics. I wished my brother was still here. He was a driver. Leslie offered to be my second pair of eyes in the passenger seat, while Timothy, Samantha, Comet, and Tara all had to squeeze in the back. Nobody wanted to sit outside. Driving around until we reached a highway that was leading out of the city, we kept our eyes trained on what was ahead of us. With each mile that we passed, a sense of dread was building up. The air inside the car was becoming more frigid, lifeless. Practically, turmoil of anxiety and tearing of the soul from my body was wrecking havoc in my head. Getting closer to whatever that barrier is made of made me want to scream and jump out of the vehicle. I felt as if everyone was thinking the same thing. Timothy refuses to look up, preferring to stare at the ground the whole time. Tara looked as if she was in a trance. Leslie kept looking right up ahead, never breaking eye contact with the barrier that had trapped everyone in. Samantha and Comet were holding hands. They too were looking at the ground, worried about what we were about to face. Are, are you guys sure you want to do this? We can always turn back, I said with a broken voice. I didn't want them to think that I was becoming afraid. I had to be the man who had to look like he was brave and ready for anything. But I'm not that kind of guy at heart. This is a face I'm putting on. No one said anything. They looked around, waiting for the other to speak up. Finally, Comet broke the silence. Yeah, I want to get out of here. Don't worry. Maybe we could drive right through it. It looks like a fog if you ask me, like smoke that's swirling around us. I tried to sound positive. The barrier stretched all the way up, leaving a small opening of light at the top. But it was a green-tinted light, like seeing the green light of a traffic sign in the middle of a thick fog without any other light source around. It illuminated every surface around us, making it difficult on the eyes. Finally, with not too many other cars that blocked the path, we reached the end, but were shocked by what we saw at the edge of the barrier. A massive pile-up of semis and other cars blocked the way, as if they turned around in a haste, but were unable to make it. Well, uh, perhaps we need to walk the rest of the way, Leslie suggested. As much as I didn't want to be walking out in the middle of a road that didn't offer many shelters besides a gas station that we saw two miles back, we had little choice. There was no way to go around, because there was a steep hill on one side and melted trees on both. And no, driving through them wasn't an option. It would be like hitting actual trees. I was the first to step out and walk through the carnage of twisted metal and more of those fleshy pancakes that littered around. Tara stuck her face closer to one of them, and six eyes opened up all over it, staring right back at her. Three mouths opened and gasped for air. I, I think I'm going to stay back from now on. She scuttled over to Comet. After all of this had been happening, and it being a day or so, I wanted a smoke. I'd been hiding the habit from my parents, but my brother found out. I told him I'd quit, but that was a lie. Now that it's just me, I could easily get away with it. But I didn't bring any with me. The stress of all this was killing me. Samantha walked beside me. Are you doing alright? Yeah, yeah, I'll do fine. I'll get by. I wonder if maybe Jeff and Jasmine were able to find some help. Not making eye contact with her, I exhaled. I doubt it. I hated how pessimistic I was acting towards her. This was my crush, after all. But I lost my family, and now I'm having to take care of a bunch of people with whom I'm not particularly close friends with. I mean, we'd grown close over the recent events, but I wouldn't say I'm ready to open up to anyone. Even my crush. 
but it did feel a little nice knowing that she cared. Thanks, I said, walking up ahead to take the lead. For what? For caring? I looked back. Samantha gave me a soft smile in return. This warmed my heart a little bit because she looked so cute. Like an adorable, nerdy girl who's into art cute. I noticed that Comet was staring at us. Her facial expression was hard to read, but she was looking at Samantha with an unflinching stare. Honestly, I hope this isn't turning into what I fear it is. But this warm moment was over when we reached the barrier. It was about a ten minute walk, but we had finally reached the end. I uh, does anyone want to try going through that? Leslie pointed at the swirling fog that was flowing past us. I ain't doing it, I replied firmly. There was something ominous about it, the way it slowly crawled, swirling, not resembling a faded haze, but more like dancing strips of clouds and smoke. And there was an echo coming from within, a moaning sound, black and gray, deathly and sorrowful. Nothing about this felt real. It felt as if it was an evil in a dream. So bitterly evil. But then again, it didn't seem like it was just malevolence incarnated. As if it was more foreign to our human comprehension, trying to understand whatever was dancing in the smoke was something that I don't think a single one of us can grasp. Looking at it too long made you feel as if you were in the middle of aging rapidly. Is there anything that we can throw in there to see if it's safe to cross through? Comet suggested. Looking around, we tried to see if maybe there was a stray dog or some sort of wild animal that we could watch cross over. But other than barren land with black sludge and green slime everywhere, there wasn't anything that we could use. But none of us were willing to sacrifice someone in the group to see if it's safe or not. At the same time, we didn't want to go back. That was also death. Uh, hey, Tara piped up. What? Leslie, who was standing closest to her, replied. I can see an opening. She spoke softly. This was getting everyone's hopes up, but what exactly was she looking at? When I looked in the same direction as her, I saw nothing but the same darkness. What are you talking about? It's not opening anywhere. Look. She had that crazy smile across her face. Her pupils were losing their light, resembling a dark void that could make you fall forever into. Looking back again, I kept my focus, but my expression of curiosity quickly turned to dread when I could see something else. Timothy, who was standing closest to the barrier but had his back turned, did not see that a pair of grey and black arms were extending out, ready to grab him. Timothy, behind you! I shouted in my panic. Turning around, he jumped back as quickly as he could, but a few of the arms managed to grab hold of his legs. They were stretching out, crawling up his body as they grabbed onto his clothes and were forcibly dragging him into them. Samantha, Leslie, Comet, and I all rushed to his aid but not Terra. She walked towards the black fog, her arms wide open. We were shouting for her to snap out of it. Clearly, she was stuck under some sort of hallucination. Her face was content with what she was about to do. A part of me wondered if maybe this was how we got out. No one wanted to let go of Timothy, but at the same time, I could tell we wanted to rush to her. I'm free, she said, right before walking into the barrier and crossing into the darkness. We watched with great anxiety that had stricken us, delaying our rescue of Timothy, but preventing him from fully being pulled in. Her face, at first, had this huge smile, only to slowly melt into extraordinary fear as she screamed out and was grabbed by all of the arms. The clouds did break for a moment, as we were able to see what was laying beyond the fog. It was beyond nightmarish. What we all got a glimpse of was a massive mass of inhuman creatures 
that stretched so high up, made of swirling, mass-like gelatin, only black and gray mixing together, forming twisted bodies that wrapped in and out of each other, stretching out arms to grab whatever got too close. Their faces were contorted, some squishing in on themselves, some expanding out until they became nothing more than a gooey slime that would remorph into more faces and bodies. Their eyes were gone, hollowed like a skull. I looked away, but I could hear Tara screaming as they dragged her into the slimy mess, drowning her, filling her with a torment that I did not believe that we should look upon. Now, more than ever, I was finding myself religious. I practically was praying to God that we would survive this nightmare of a world that we were in. Comet was so disturbed and let go of Timothy to slowly crawl over to where her friend used to be. The arms lessened their grip, maybe because one of us already passed through. With enough strength, we were able to finally pull Timothy away from them. My attention quickly went over to Comet, worried that she might get too close. But she never did. She clearly knew better. We were beaten, broken, lost, not even willing to drag my feet forward anymore. Only five of us left. One by one, I kept watching someone die. And despite everything that I've tried, despite all of my ideas on how to escape, they don't work. Almost feels like everything I try has been a painful waste. Breathing becomes more difficult. What have I done? A world that's against me. What can I, a mere human who is not strong, fast, smart, or resourceful, do? When we got back to the truck... We were surprised to find it crushed under a large footprint. This only served to demoralize us more. So, we kept walking down the road, hoping that another car could be found. But the calm was interrupted. Guys? Leslie spoke to us. Timothy asked. What is it? Is that a rain cloud? I looked up, away from the hard concrete, to see clouds slowly descending towards us, with a strange green haze that was a sign of death coming. We should probably find somewhere to rest for now, I suggested urgently, pointing towards the gas station nearby. Everyone quickly ran to take cover. We shut the door tight, grabbing what heavy racks we could find to push them in front of the door. Thankfully, it didn't have the huge glass windows, which would have left us completely exposed to the outside, so it felt safer like this. Plus, there was food and water. Quickly, Timothy was filling up a backpack with chips and other snacks. Leslie was getting what non-edible supplies she could find. Samantha and Comments didn't have anything to do, because I honestly believe that this has taken more of a psychological toll on them. I, for once was always told by my dad that you need to stay strong. If you have people who are relying on you, you need to keep a stiff upper lip and never let them see weakness. How I wish my brother were here. I hate that all of this is slowly starting to roll towards my way, and I'm growing quite weary myself. Samantha saw me and approached. Her beautiful blue eyes focused on me. Again, it felt good that she was taking an interest in me. This was my crush, after all, and I was going to see to it to the end that we make it out alive. Or, at least, share my first kiss with her. Whatever works. You alright? Tired. Same. Talking was more difficult. I'm sure we both knew what I was going to say, but we both knew how bad that would be. Sleep deprivation was starting to take its toll on me. Becoming constantly tired out from all the running, trying to look over your shoulder, the fact that you'll get a nightmare if you even think about closing your eyes for a wink. Maybe we could get some sleep tonight, she rasped. I practically was giving her a cold look, unintentionally. I wouldn't, not unless you want to risk it. It drove that one girl insane. 
The quiet was quickly overwhelming both of us, and I didn't want to talk anymore. I hated this. I hated the fact that I had to defend everyone here. It was embittering. My whole life being torn to shreds by this. My family's dead. My friends are dropping like flies. And to think it was only a party that I wanted to go to. Nothing cruel. Nothing wicked. Nothing devious. Just a party and a magical night to enjoy as we grew older. It's raining, Comet announced, staring out a window behind the cash register. We rushed to the door to see if the rain was the same as the first one. Sure enough, green slime. And if it touches any organic matter, it turns you into a pancake of flesh, bone, and organs. I need to sleep, I mumbled. A part of me was thinking maybe it'd be better if I was driven into insanity. It'd be a lot better to die that way. Samantha burst out screaming, which sent everyone into a shocked panic. She was backing away from the window, running towards the bathroom door. Everyone was wondering what this was all about until we turned back and saw exactly why she was screaming. There was something out there. It was moving like a silhouette in the rain, lingering like a ghost. It was tall, bipedal, and had the same shape of the head as the creature I saw back in the city. Oh shoot, I said, quickly backing away from the window. I'm guessing everyone else saw, and we all quickly went to the back of the building to huddle. This was agonizing. If it sees us, we're dead. No doubt about it. It could tear this gas station apart and we'd be exposed to the rain. This could end up being our grave. Do you think it saw us? Timothy whispered. I don't. Uh, maybe not. Then we heard a vibration shake the ground. Timothy's jaw dropped. Footsteps that were getting closer with each passing second. It was coming towards us. We held our breaths, waiting for what might have been death, knocking on our door. We looked towards the window. It was between Leslie and Comet. Samantha at the far right near the bathroom door, Timothy on the left next to the register. We stared through the green slime that was coating the glass, anxiously waiting for something to happen. Maybe it's gone, Comet said. But the ground shook violently and the entire building along with it. Chunks of the ceiling were breaking off, falling toward the center of the room until a huge, gaping hole was created. Samantha tried to hold back a scream, but it wasn't enough. A reflex overtook her, and dozens of tentacles descended through the hole, picking up all of the cans, chips, and soda bottles that were scattered all across the white marble floor. One of the tentacles was lingering towards us, it was dark, pink, slimy, and throbbing with veins. It looked cancerous, with massive layers of tumors covering over it. Is this what this thing was? Was it cancer cells that formed into a single life form? I'm not a genius, nor do I know anything about what's going on, so this is a guess of mine. We nearly were about to scatter as the tentacle lingered over us, dripping with green slime. I was frozen where I was about ready to puke over the smell of this thing. Imagine being trapped in a porta potty An old one that never gets cleaned. That's this thing. The acid was boiling over in my throat, and I could tell everyone was feeling the same. Oh, that stinks, Leslie muttered. I wished everyone would shut up for a moment, let it pass, but that wasn't to be. Ironically, it would be me that couldn't hold it in. I threw up. It overwhelmed me, and I couldn't breathe any more of this nauseous gas. The tentacles began to freak out. They whipped around, thrashing through the racks of supplies and food, definitely ruining any chances of us having an extended stay here. Everyone was quick to duck from many pieces of metal that might come ricocheting towards us. This whole time, I could hear screaming from both sides of my ears. I was speechless, unable to mutter a sound out of fear. I thought about sacrificing myself, 
Maybe save everyone from a horrible fate should this thing get its tentacles around them. But it was not to be, because it was starting to pull back. Another sound of a moan broke through the air outside. Something had called to it, and the sound of this creature replied with a great aggression in its tone. It was retreating, much to our relief. But we celebrated too quickly. When we finally worked up the nerve to get up, Leslie did not. We hadn't noticed yet, but she had. A shard of metal was lodged into her stomach. Timothy got back down towards her side. No, 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 Leslie. She wasn't responding, but not dead. I took another look and saw a green slime covering the metal bar lodged into her. She's... she's going to melt, I said grimly. You don't know that. Timothy fired, his eyes tearing up and his mouth baring his teeth with anger. I felt so much guilt. Had I held out a little longer, had I not let any of the smell get to me, now I had cost someone their life. I... I didn't... Timothy consoled her as the area around the green slime was starting to liquefy, causing the hole to grow bigger and more blood to spill out. She coughed, unable to speak. She held up one hand and gently rubbed it against Timothy's face. He cried more profusely. She pulled him closer, just a little gently, and the two of them locked each other into a hug. He sobbed hard, and she remained stoic. But just like that, her hand dropped, and she went limp. Her eyes went lifeless. I couldn't say anything. None of us could. Again, I felt like all of this was for nothing. And what made this worse was that the guilt was now on me. All because I couldn't hold my stomach in. Timothy, I... He quickly turned around and grabbed me by the collar, his eyes streaming with tears down his cheeks. Gritting his teeth, he pulled me closer and then threw me back hard. I crashed against the counter. God, okay, yeah, I deserve that. You deserve a lot worse. He lashed out at me. I was expecting him to proceed to hold me down and begin pummeling me, but Samantha and Comet were quick to try and block him from getting any closer towards me. Out of the way. He raged. Comet said calmly, Think this through. I know you're mad, but this isn't going to help at all. We need each other. No. No way could I ever be in a group with him anymore. We never told any of you this, but we loved each other. Samantha replied. Yeah, we kind of got the gist of that. Screw you guys. Leave me alone. He quickly went back to Leslie's body, pressing his forehead against hers. Not a single one of us could muster up the strength to talk to him anymore. I walked as far as I could to the other side, trying to avoid the rain that was now dripping in. Three long, agonizing hours passed. Timothy doesn't talk to anyone anymore. I had lost all reason to continue on with this. There's no way out. We have a limited supply of food and water. The rain won't quit and there are monsters of incomprehensible imagination running around. At this point, perhaps I should embrace the green slime and become one of those blobs. Jack, Samantha calmly ushered. Yeah. We can't stay here much longer. Why? She slowly pointed towards the part of the store with the huge gaping hole in the center and I took one look at the ground from where the green slime was building up. It was evaporating into steam. Green steam. That's not good. Grabbing some more plastic bags that we could find that were dry, we wrapped them over ourselves, trying to cover up as much of our bodies as we could. Timothy did not join us. He never left Leslie's side. Her entire bottom half was practically all melted away at this point, 
and it was slowly making a crawl up her torso. Timothy, we, uh, I struggled to find the words. Go, he said, coldly. Comet replied. You'll die here if you stay. He looked back at us. His eyes were empty of all hope. I don't care. My family's gone. I have no other reason to keep going. Leslie was the only person I was close to. I wanted to be her hero, and now she's dead. I'm done with fighting to live. I couldn't say anything. None of us could. So, I did what I had to. I opened the door and turned back towards him. Take care. I think both of us knew that this was where he decided that his journey would end. He had lost all hope. I think he wanted to be with Leslie to the bitter end, like my brother and his girlfriends did. You too, he said back, giving me a glimmer that he was understanding of the hopelessness we were in, but also not holding a grudge as much towards me anymore. I stepped out first wondering if I would feel any of the green slime touch my skin. Thankfully, the clothes and plastic wrapping were giving me the added protection that I needed. But I was worried about that steam. Breathing that stuff in might actually start to cause the same effect. I don't know, but why take the chance? Where to next? Comet asked. I couldn't see well. The green slime was limiting my field of vision. Let's see if we can find a car. Maybe we can go back into the city and hide somewhere. We kept on the road, passing by dozens of broken down vehicles. They were either crushed, crashed on the side of the road, or into each other. I wasn't sure how much longer we couldn't handle being dumped on by all of this rain, and the steam was starting to pick up. A green fog was starting to lift out from the ground and I was increasingly becoming worried about breathing. Maybe we can... I was interrupted when I lost my footing and nearly plummeted into a sinkhole in the middle of the road. It must have been new because this is the same road we had come from when we went to the barrier. I quickly managed to grab hold of the edge. Samantha and Comet rushed over to grab me. Finally, I was lifted back up. I'm more surprised that it snuck up on me. That was a close one, I jested. Very, Samantha answered back. Why do you think the sinkhole's here? Comet asked. I'm not so sure. It could be because of all the rain. We took a look down at the bottom, and for a split second, through the black haze, I saw something. Lights. A brief shimmer of it cracking through the darkness. Wait. Are you guys seeing what I'm seeing? The look on the girls was a smile that was breaking through the tears that were starting to form. We saw a blue light on the other side. Somehow, on the other side of this sinkhole was the way back home. Back to Earth. At least, that's what I'm thinking. We can go down there and escape this nightmare. Samantha eagerly said, practically already wanting to take her descent. Well, hold on. Shouldn't we go tell Timothy, or maybe other people trapped here? I suggested. Comet rebunked. He doesn't care. As much as I don't want to leave him behind, he won't come with us. He hates you. She pointed at me. I wanted to fight with her on that, yet a part of me felt like it was true. That's... Not untrue. I'm sorry, Jack. This is my only chance to get out of here. Samantha replied. I'm not going to wait for others. I had to concur. We couldn't go around telling everybody in the city about this sinkhole. Not unless one of us wants to stay behind and tell everyone. But then we might die in the process. I was faced with a dilemma. Do I choose the unselfish route? Warn any survivors about how there might be a way out, but run the risk of dying from the slime and monsters, or do I take my opportunity, right now, and get back to the safety of Earth? Before I could even come to that decision, 
we were interrupted yet again. A low, groaning roar boomed from behind us. It was one of those giants again. It spotted us, and it was coming at us at full speed, its large, mangling claws completely extended out to tear us to pieces. Looks like the hole is our only option, I remarked. Getting down was going to be a problem. It was probably somewhere between an 85 to 90 degree drop. I had to admit, jumping down didn't look so safe either, but we were wasting time as this creature came charging towards us thanks to that hesitation. Flashes of lightning illuminated all around us, revealing what kind of monster we were up against. It was a beast of evil incarnate, standing on two legs. Its body was a dark, sickly yellow color, more than a hundred feet tall, and had four long, loosely fitting skin arms. A tail with bone protrusions, roughly half the size of the entire monster's body. Its head was supported by a crooked, skeletal neck, and on top of that, it had a face that made me feel like I was on the verge of an aneurysm. It was twisted skin, tendrils dangling from a mouth filled with bloody, jagged teeth and gums shredded by those same teeth, and a head that was shaped like a human skull, an abomination born from the microorganisms of our world. At least, that's the theory. As I was about to say screw it and jump straight into the hole, it quickly turned around and swung its tail down, separating me and Comet from Samantha. It proceeded to swing the tail towards my direction, but I quickly grabbed Comet's arm, and we dove down to the ground as the tail swung over us. Jump! I shouted to Samantha. She appeared like she was about to disregard what I said and come to our rescue, but stopped when the monster let out an agonizingly loud, screeching sound that managed to induce temporary deafness onto us. We held on to our ears, and I watched as the creature stomped the ground hard, causing Samantha to lose her footing and fall into the hole. I crawled to the edge and watched as she slowly descended into the darkness, falling into the center where the light was. When this happened, everything seemed to be in slow motion. It was as if I was on the verge of death itself, and my body's adrenaline was giving me all this time to spend. I yelled, although I can no longer hear. I love you. She must have been able to read my lips, because she also said something. Me too. The light disappeared before she reached the bottom, leaving her to vanish into the darkness and leaving me to wonder what her fate was. Turning onto my back, the creature knelt down and glared at me with its red eyes. They told me two different stories, predatory glare and agonizing pain. It opened its mouth up, revealing the tendrils to me, preparing to devour. I froze, unable to find the will to move anymore. Samantha was probably safe but I still wasn't sure what more I could do for Comet. She was not in the creature's line of sight and was trying to decide what to do next. Leave me to my fate and jump, or try to assist me by getting the monster's attention. I didn't want her to do that. By then, my hearing, and what I assume hers as well, had returned. Run, Comet! I shouted as hard as I could, and the creature lunged at me. But before it did, another flash of lightning shattered through the air and rain, striking the creature in the back. It let out a painful moan and stepped to the ground on the edge of the hole. I watched as the ground around its foot began to crumble and it lost its footing. The ground cracked and heaved, breaking apart and tugging the creature's leg down with it. It raised its head defiantly to the storm, slowly sinking into the abyss in the process. Collapsing all the way down, and with a final, low, rumbling roar, it was gone. And unfortunately, it managed to collapse the edge of the sinkhole, burying the exit. But the joy of having it out of my hair was exhilarating. I was unable to process how lucky we were. I slowly started to chuckle. My chuckling turned into laughter, and that turned into hysterical crying. Finally, this creature was gone, 
and we could take our leap as well. Jack, she spoke with a sorrowful undertone. I looked back at Comet, my eyes widening when I saw what had happened. The lower part of her pants were torn open, covering up with green slime. I ran as quickly as I could, feeling a slight pain in my leg. I caught her just as she was about to fall to the ground. Hold on, I'm going to... She held her hand to my mouth, giving me the look that told me enough. She knew it. I knew it. This was as far as she went. I don't feel right. Everything feels unreal. Like, like I'm floating through jello. She shook. I pulled her close, ignoring my own safety. I'm here. I'm right here. Her arms gripped tighter around my back. She spoke with a whisper, like the air was escaping out of her lungs. Please, survive. I'm sorry. I felt her grip loosen and her head fall back. And almost as soon as she stopped moving, her face started to melt. I watched in horror as every layer of her body turned into a slimy, fleshy mound. I didn't want to leave her side, for an untold number of hours out there completely exposed. I didn't care if I melted too. I had lost everything, and waited there until the rain stopped. If I survived it, I was going to make a promise. A promise to her, Samantha, wherever she was, and to my brother, as well as all my other friends. I stayed long enough to see that she was reduced to the same fleshy pancake form as every other human being that I have come across. I wondered if maybe a part of her was still alive in it. I wanted to pick it up and perhaps hide somewhere with it, but that would be disrespectful. And then the rain stopped. I had my choice to make. I got up and walked back towards the city. The sinkhole was covered, but maybe I could go and inform everyone else. Possibly we could unearth it and escape. I couldn't bear the thought of letting hundreds of men, women, children, and babies be turned into what Comet and so many other unfortunate people have become. I don't think I want to live with that sort of guilt weighing on my conscience if I left now. When I got back to the city, I discovered more holes over the weeks. Regrettably, they either are buried over by too much dirt or sand, or are too small to fit through. But I keep trying to inform others about the big one. So far, nobody seems willing to go unless we get a large crowd together. I'm not much of a leader, so perhaps someone braver will come along and inspire the hope that we have lost. As I finish writing this, I'm going to throw it through another small hole that I found in the basement of some large tower. I'm hoping that if you find it, you'll know that I'm trying my best to do the right thing for my friend's sake. Goodbye.